It's more like it.
There, that should be a bit better. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm, uh, I've actually got the microphone turned on now. That's good. So, <clears throat> I'm feeling a little under the weather today. So, if you, if I'm speaking a little quietly and you'd like me to, uh, turn up the volume, please let me know. Um, Hmm. It says chat rate is 4, but I don't see any chats. Let's see. Popping it out usually makes that refresh. Oh, there we go. Hello. Yep. Yep. Hello. Do I, Yes, that is the inevitable question. Do I have... Do I have the plague? I don't know. It might be. I, I might have the plague. Certainly the plague is the thing that's going around lately. Um, I don't know. Maybe I got it at the supermarket. It's probable. I only ever go to the supermarket, so um, it's possible that I got it at the supermarket. Because it's either, it's either um, I got it at the supermarket or, or Allie, my wife, brought it home from work. Which I don't think is reasonable but you know because i got it first of the two of us she doesn't seem to have it yet but uh, then again if it is if it is the plague apparently you know half the time when you have it you don't even know you have it so you know also um i don't know i have this i have this theory that um you know like half of what half of what you get um uh when you when you're when you have a cold, it, you, the symptoms of the cold are, cold are very often your immune response to the cold. So if you have a suppressed immune response, then the um, you don't you might not feel the cold as badly, something like that. But then it gets worse, and then you really do feel it. Um, anyway, anyway, um, yeah. So I've I don't know if you're interested in my symptoms. I have a sore throat general lethargy and just a general feeling that I wish I weren't doing anything. Like, honestly, I was playing a little bit of, like, a puzzle game on my phone before this this whole shindig got started, and it was a lot of effort just to swipe around. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna go, um, this afternoon and, uh, and, uh, have my nasal passages very strongly violated, so... Yeah, anyway, I say this less for the sympathy of the general population and more just because, just to explain the, the fact that I'm probably not going to be as high energy as I normally am. Um, so yeah. So anyway, that might actually, uh, <laughs> Rona or quarantine fatigue. Um, yes. Um... No, it, well, actually, it's kind of interesting. Like, when one works oneself to exhaustion, sometimes my body, like, pretends to have a cold, so I'll take a day off once in a while. Um, but uh, this time, I'm pretty sure that this is the genuine article. I have my nice mentholated tea this morning. It's like Vicks in a cup. Um, yeah, so, yeah, I don't know, my corona, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get tested, because, you know, that's the responsible thing to do, so, um, <clears throat> oh, let's hope you're neg, let's hope I'm negative, I don't know, in some ways, I'd, I'd rather, like, have it and get it over with in some ways, you know? But, you know, it's not like, it's not like the coronavirus is the only virus. It's not like all other viruses ceases, ceased to exist when coronavirus hit. And quite frankly, um, it, fe it feels bacterial to me rather than viral. Um... But, you know, 
you know, to the degree that you can tell that. Anyway, so, um, so let's continue talking about uh, programming and stuff. We were talking about strings. So let me just load up my Python interpreter. So strings then. Um, strings, just to quick recap, strings are very similar to tuples in a lot of ways, except rather than, uh, rather than being a linear collection of an arbitrary data type, uh, strings specifically operate over characters. The sort of basic element of a string as a character, um, some of the uh, some of the more observant of you, uh, yeah, last class, were noticing that the space that's uh, contained in strings, that is also considered a character. Like, uh, you can index over these bad boys. So string is equal to hello world. If you want to see how many there uh, characters there are in a string, and this works on tuples as well, you get 13. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And um, similarly to a tuple, if you want to access the fourth element, remember things are zero indexed, uh, you can do that using normal indexing. Generally speaking, most of the operations that work on tuples are transferable to strings and vice versa. Um, strings and tuples are very similar. They are, they're both immutable data types, for example, as well. So, um, in Python, as distinct from other programming languages, you can use either single or double quotes to, um, to, uh, designate something as being a string rather than being, you know, part of the regular code. Um, you know, this is equivalent to this. They're the same thing. Um, I think I think I just figured out what the uh, why Python seems to have a general preference for single quotes, and that's because it requires one less keystroke to produce single quotes as opposed to double quotes. So technically speaking, single quotes are just a little bit faster to write. So. Um, one, so here are some rules about strings, though. If you want to have a string that includes one of the uh, sort of characters that delimit strings inside of the string, um, you gotta you gotta somehow designate that that's what you're doing. You can either use the escape character. The escape character is this. I suppose for you it's mirrored, so it's the slash. Uh, I'm not sure if those that's slash or backslash. I've never been quite uh, firm on the difference. But um, if you want that character in the string, then you've got two options. You either perform an escape sequence, which is what that slash does, or um, you use quotes of the opposite type. Since you're using quotes of the opposite type, um, Python will automatically know that this uh, this single quote is not the end of the string that you're designating, which is what it thinks it is in uh, in this case. That's why it's saying and what you know this is a string that has no terminating character. Since it starts with a double quote, it knows that it will end with a double quote as well. So any single quotes within it are known to be characters and not string delimiters. So yeah. Um, but that's, 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 uh, that's different from many of the other programming languages that you'll likely have been using up to this point in time. Um, if, you're, if you're a person who's used anything like Java or C++ or JavaScript or C or like basically most C-based languages um, recognize a distinction between single and double quotes. In most languages, a character 
is designated as using single quotes, and a string is designated as using double quotes. So, um, if you wanted to op if you wanted to have just an A in C, for instance, you would designate it like that. But uh, this sort of plays into another one of the interesting little curveballs that Python throws you, um, in that um, Python doesn't actually recognize a distinction between characters and strings. So, you know, and this is this is a little bit strange if you if you know any other type of programming language, um, but in Python. You know, basically they hide all of the details for you so that everything eventually makes sense as long as you don't think too hard about it. Um, so, for example, in other programming languages, the data type of the elements of a collection, such as a tuple or a list, or um, most of them call them arrays. Uh, so I'll use the term array. Uh, in most programming languages, when you declare an array, you also declare a type that's associated with that array, the type of the elements of the array. So you would have an array of integers, or you'd have an array of floating point numbers. <clears throat> in Python, you don't have that um, since everything is of any type, uh, and Python is handling all of the memory management for you, it's not necessary to have strict typing restrictions like that. Uh, the reason for those strict restrictions in other languages, incidentally, is because the type of the, um, the type of the elements is used to allocate the memory necessary for the array. So, if you have a 32-bit integer, you know that the bit width of the integer is 32 bits. So you just multiply the number of bits by the declared length of the array. Incidentally, that's the other thing that you have to declare with an array is the size of it, so it knows how much memory to allocate to you. So you declare as much memory as that array needs um, uh, up front because you know the size of each element and the number of elements you're declaring. Fine. In Python, everything's dynamic, so uh, not only can things grow or shrink dynamically, and it handles everything in, in the back end for you, um, it'll accommodate the various sizes of the things you put into uh, these lists automatically without you having to worry about it too much. Now the interesting thing about all of that is it's not like it isn't doing this stuff in the back end. Um, Fundamentally, uh, what I've just the, the the thing I've just described to you is actually the way that computer memory works. Period. Um, so it's not that Python is using the compute underlying computer differently. It's just sandwiching a whole lot more bookkeeping between you and the processor, so that it can have all of these interesting dynamic properties. Um, so, you know, fundamentally way, way down in the code, there is some place in Python where characters are distinct from strings, just not at the user level. But yeah, um, let me see if there are any questions. Backslash, thank you. How would you define something as a character in Python then? Uh, characters in Python are defined just as uh, uh, strings with one element. So if you if you want to use a character, just uh, just uh, a string containing one element is the manner in which you do that in Python. Um, oh uh, yeah, so the test is in fact on Saturday. I should probably take a, a brief interlude now that we probably have most of the people who are going to be here here. Um, we should talk s briefly about the test. Um, so, and also, yes, 
uh, if you submit through Avenue, you don't have to submit through Jupyter Hub and vice versa. They are intended as, uh, uh, think of it as having two different drop boxes on two different sides of, you know, JHE or BSB or something. Um, if you can't make it to one drop box, then you can use the other one. We'll pick up from both. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, with respect to the test, uh, I often get questions about the test because it's somewhat confusing to people. I run my tests differently uh, than a number of, like, I don't, th I think the way that I run my tests is pretty far outside the norm for how tests are run, but I, uh, last week, I, at the end of last week, I got my, um, my teaching evaluations from the previous semester, and I took a look through, and one of the things that was sort of universally acclaimed, uh, one thing that a lot of students felt I did well, was the manner in which the tests were organized. So once you understand how the tests work, um, they're actually a, a much lower stress environment than, you know, uh, a tests normally are, I think. So this is how it works. The test document will become available for you to download and start working on at 9 a.m. this Saturday. The test must be submitted by 9 a.m. on Sunday, the next day. You have a 24-hour period in which you may work on the test. Now, if you now the the amount of forgiveness that we have for people submitting the test after 9 a.m. on Sunday is going to be pretty small. Um, you know, if you're over the deadline by, you know, conceivably the amount of time that it would take to correct an error and, like, for example, realize that you have to use the other submission mechanism and then submit it, you know, there's about that much forgiveness that we'll be willing to exercise. But, you know, uh, generally speaking, you should think of 9 a.m. Sunday as being an extremely hard deadline because it's a test. The only exception to this, of course, is anybody who has an, a pre-submitted um, uh, student accessibility uh, uh, accommodation plan. If you have an accommodation plan, then you get some bonus time on the test in accordance with your accommodation. Um, if you have any questions about that, it's it's basically the calculation is based on the on a 24-hour writing period, and you should know what that means if you have one of these accommodations. So, um, yes. Uh, oh, is there also well, the problem with the problem with having a class like I, this class is I cannot possibly um, accommodate. Like, it's impossible for me to set a test when somebody doesn't have a test in the class. So um, if you feel that you're going to be under a, a undue amount of strain um, with the test, please uh, email me and we can perhaps work something out. I'll get to your questions uh, in just a moment. So with respect to the test, First of all, I'd like to point out the existence on Avenue of a uh, of a crib sheet, which I generally I believe it's under extra resources. Um, yes, exam syntax reference sheet. You may find this helpful during the test. This is um, normally when I'm doing tests in a more like control or exams in a more controlled environment. This is what I give to my students as like a crib sheet type thing. Um, haven't used it in a while for obvious reasons, but this might be useful to you during as quick reference during the test. Um, generally speaking, the test is under a take-home test model, uh, which is kind of unusual for a STEM class, but you know, these are the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, so 
things that are permitted, you may uh, reference the, you may take a look at the Python documentation. Uh, I don't even necessarily mind if you are looking at Stack Overflow for reference, but this has to be for the purpose of reference. Uh, don't copy code from external sources. All of the code that you write has to be, all of the code that you put in your test must be stuff that you wrote yourself. Um, no collaboration with other students is permitted during the test. So you guys can't collaboratively write your, your test answers. Everybody's test answer must be their own individual work. This should come as no surprise. Um, oh man, I forgot to announce about a Piazza being open. I'll get to that too. Um, so, okay. So we've, I, I, the, the, um, uh, let me finish the description. We will have the forum open. Um, generally speaking, during a test, the way that things work when you're writing a test in person is that you can raise your hand and ask a clar clarifying question about a test question while the test is going on. For, uh, for this class, we will be using Piazza for that. We've moved from, Piazza, from Trello to Piazza. Uh, I'll talk about Piazza very shortly, and I'll get to these questions in the chat. Um, so it's an open, open book test, which means that I consider um, you know, various reference sources on the internet to be the textbook, uh, if that makes sense. You have 24 hours to write the test in. Um, you may work on the test for, an, uh, uh, you know, the a number of hours that you may work on the test is uh, limited to 24. Um, so essentially you may work on the test for any amount of time within the 24 hour period. It's not limited to two hours or anything. Um, there's no, um, there's no, uh, oh, what do they call that? Where they're like, where they're watching you while you write the test. Not invigilation. There's a special term for it. Um, You know, you guys know what I'm talking about, though. Like when they, you have to have your webcam on, and they're like watching you write the test. That thing, I forgot what they call that. Jeez, I really am out of it today. Um, um, proctoring. Thank you. Interlocution. Yes. Uh, yeah. Online proctoring. We're not using online proctoring. The other reason that we use a 24-hour test writing model is because um, a number of your classmates are from jurisdictions that are uh, different than... I know, I'm going to answer the questions. Look at chat. I am looking at chat. Um, a number of people are going to be writing from places like India and China, where if I set a test to start at like, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning here, local time, they would be starting a test at 11 o'clock at night, where I don't see that as being uh, a fair way of writing the test. So um, within that 24 hour period, um, you are, you know, you may write the test in whatever um, time slot is best for you. That being said, uh, the people who are answering questions on Piazza do, generally speaking, live on in Ontario. So um, keep in mind that if it's 2 a.m. our time, there's probably not going to be a TA on Piazza to answer questions. So you might want to. Uh, but by that time, uh, it's probable that most of the questions that you probably will have about the test will have already been answered if you check back in the previous answers. So I'm going to get to the questions in the chat now. Um, is the test through JHub? Yes, uh, the test will be administered through the exact and precise same manner as the assignments. 
Um, will the test be available to be worked on through Jupyter Hub in a similar manner to the assignments? Yes. Um, around how many questions will the test be? I do not divulge that type of information before a test. Um, I won't tell you. Sorry, you're just going to have to see the test. Um, will you have to create your own test cases? Uh, no, we will, prov we will provide uh, visible test cases for you. Um, you don't have to worry about that. We will provide visible test cases. Visible test cases. However, I always encourage students to write some test cases their own of their own. Te you know, um, relying <coughs> relying solely and exclusively on the on the visible test cases provided by us. Um, you know. If you want to be really sure of your answer, I recommend testing it outside of the, te the, the uh, test cases provided. And that's true for uh, everything, not just the test. What topics will be on the test? That's very good. A uh, good question. Uh, the test coverage will be up to the end of the slide set we're currently on, so um, up to the end of expressions. Um, can you start the test and come back to it later throughout the day? Um, yes. So, yeah, you may work on the test at whatever points during the day you have time to work on the tests. Um, you're not, like, like if you want to throw, you know, an hour in, at it in the morning and an hour at it in the evening or whatever, then there you go. That's, um, yep. We're not going to dictate that for you. The only restriction is that your completed test must be submitted by 9 a.m. Sunday, Eastern Standard Time. Your access code for Piazza isn't working. Please uh, email me. You heard the cat. Um, yeah, probably. Probably you heard the cat. Uh, <laughs> Um, can I, can you submit the test on Avenue? Yes. On average, how long should the test take to write? So that's a, that's a tricky question. Uh, generally speaking, it's been my observation that when students are given a 24 hour test writing period, they tend to use a lot more time than when the test is uh, designated for a two hour time span. Um, I would say that generally speaking, the test shouldn't take the test is designed to take, uh, you know, two hours, two, two and a half hours, I'd say, under normal test writing circumstances, which is to say you in a room looking at your test, writing your test, you know, and us watching you. People tend to write much more quickly under these those sorts of invigilation type, you know, um, circumstances. Um, that, like, <clears throat> so, how long you actually take on the test to some degree is up to you. Um, I feel, um, I, uh, like, I feel like four or five hours is about average, the average amount of time people take for them. Um, some people take as long as eight or ten hours to do them. Um, I would say that the, uh, you know, this is kind of a mean professor thing to say, but generally speaking, I'd say the amount of time it takes you to do the test is proportional to the amount of studying, or inversely proportional to the amount of studying that you did before the test. So, yeah, obviously, if you know the material better and you're better practiced, then it'll it won't take you as long to do the test. But, um, but yeah, so the, the, you know, the answer to your question is like, it, like there is a huge standard deviation on that. So nothing I can, I'm going to say can be meaningful. Um, probably if you, like, if you're one of these types of people that's taking this course, you already know Python, you're t sort of taking it at, for the prerequisite or whatever so that you can do a minor in CS or something like that, 
uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if like half hour to 45 minutes was about the time amount of time it would take you. You know, um, generally speaking, uh, we try to set t a, a test that I can do um, in half an hour is a test that you can do in four uh, in, in, in not so sorry, not four hours, two hours. You multiply by four to get the students writing time, generally speaking. But uh, um, so if all the test cases you provide. Yeah, 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 exactly. If you can pass all of the visible test cases we provide and you do some investigation on your own to make sure there aren't any, you know, um, sometimes a branch doesn't get tested by our test cases, you know. Um, we try to make sure that it does, but, you know. It, yeah. um, can you be somewhat sure to get a good mark? Yes, you can be reasonably sure that you'll get a decent mark. Um, if you can pass the vis the visible test cases, um, I'd say, you know, you're probably looking at uh, at least uh, 70 or 80. But, um, you know, does it take your most recent submission or just the first one? It'll take your most recent submission. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am a little bit low energy today. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm going to get tested this afternoon, probably. Uh, see if I can get an appointment or whatever, however they do it now. Because um, uh, it's growth. It's gross. Uh, what would I recommend for practice? I recommend coding bad. So, if you go to coding bat coding bat python um, here's a bunch of extra practice items which are really good um, it'll give you a little problem it'll give you some test cases and it'll show you the solution and it'll like um, it'll show you how many test cases you pass etc etc so this is cool. I really recommend coding bat in terms of the specific areas. Uh, I think probably you guys should be able to cover um, logic one, warm up one, warm up two, maybe. Yeah, loops. You uh, so um, so this test is not going to be very difficult in comparison to the tests that will be later in the course. Obviously, this is really, you know, early in the course. Uh, the primary purpose of this test is diagnostic for because um, uh, the um, we what we need we want to get you guys some good feedback to see, you know, am I doing well in this course? Am I understanding the core concepts? If you don't understand loops and if statements, then that is something that needs to be very seriously addressed before you um, progress in the course. And, um, <clears throat> pardon me, um, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with the material that's being presented so far, then uh, you may wish to like, basically, this is the feedback that you would need to decide that you need to drop the course if that's the case, um, essentially. Uh, that's why the, this test is so early in the course. But, yes. Um, you can submit through both Avenue or Jupiter. Uh, we would hope that you would choose one of those and not both, but... Uh, both are available to you. Is it all coding or is there also theory? It's all coding. Generally, you'll find that uh, every single mark that you get in this course is as the result of you writing programs. Because I feel that, uh, I, you know, personally I'm an applied scientist and I always have a feeling that um, the real demonstration that you under the theory understand the theory is that you can put it into practice. 
so to get a 12 takes more than just doing well on the test cases and your own. Well, the thing about getting a 12 is that, um, generally speaking, you should make sure that your code does stuff like not throw an error if we give, if we ask you to process a list and then we throw an empty list at you. Like, there are certain edge cases that, um, that still mean that your program is correct. Like, um, zero, you always want to test your output if you give it zero and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it kind of, it's, it's difficult for me to s describe today. We have a, a, um, a unit on it coming up, but essentially the, the program has to be re well written. Uh, which is, you know, kind that's not very useful, I understand, because it's kind of a nebulous concept. But, um, um, so should you be able to do warm up one, two, and logic one before the test? Um, yeah, um, there might be a couple of, I haven't gone through these things thoroughly, uh, so there might be one or two things that ask for things we haven't covered yet, but generally speaking, yeah, that, that's, that's a very good test preparation. I believe that there's also some, uh, on Avenue, I, uh, there might be some test practice as well. Yeah, practice test one. This is also a good resource, although this is problems that are written on paper rather than problems that are um, written, um, out. Uh, uh, they're not, you know, these don't have the test cases, but this, these are also extremely good practice. Um, these questions have been used for tests in the past, so in this course. So they're also good preparation. Uh, when will you receive feedback for assignment one? Um, within a few days, I'm sure Basil's already on the case. Uh, will the edge cases be in the test cases? Um, Sometimes those will be in the visible test cases, sometimes they will not. So, you know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we should probably continue on with this topic. I think that's... Oh, no, I still have to talk about Piazza. So, um, some of you may have seen the announcement, some of you may not have seen the announcement. Um, we're going to use Piazza now. Uh, I see some of you have already found it. Essentially, this is, this, is, uh, this is the software that I wanted to use, but then they switched it to a paid model, and I was like, well, damn, I can't, I can't ask for money from you guys, because then nobody will use the bloody thing. So then, Piazza lately came out with this amendment that um, basically they'll do the Wikipedia thing and bother you for money until you've given them money, but you don't a you're not actually at any point required to give them money. So this is, you know, they get money for their servers, hypothetically, uh, if, the, if you find the service useful, uh, which I'm sure that you will by the end of it. Um, and we still get to have the entire class included with no paywall. So essentially, the, um, the thing about Piazza is that it is organized in such a manner that you guys can collaboratively uh, come up with questions. You can ask questions um, in a wiki style. Uh, the um, instructors may also provide answers. Um, in a wiki style, one of the main advantages of this system over Trello is that the instructor answer is very clearly delineated from the student answer. It allows for follow-up questions. There's a system where you can like reference older questions by, uh, by their question number, like this here, you know. Um, it's just a much better, cleaner, more precise system for Q&A. Um, Piazza is delicious. So, um, 
the other thing that you can do is you can make memes and you can copy memes in and the memes are there. So if you if you like memes, you can do memes in Piazza. Um, so, um, yes. Uh, don't overdo it, though. Because you know how people overdo it sometimes. Um, so anyway, um, this is cool. Piazza is really good. If you're still using Trello, please jump over to Piazza because we're gonna we're gonna stop Trello in completely um, pro within the couple of next couple of days. I haven't actually seen it to see if people are still using Trello, but stop using Trello. Use Piazza instead. You gotta use Piazza. Gotta use Piazza. So. Yeah, and the other nice thing about uh, Piazza is that you can ask a question publicly or privately. So if you want to address a question just to myself or the TAs, you can you can address that privately. Um, so uh, that's good as well. Um, you know, during the test one of the things that we would like to not see ever for any reason is your code published publicly to our forum or any other forum. However, if you really need to show the, you know, myself or the TAs your code, um, you can either use email, which is always private, or you can ask a, a private question through Piazza. Um, that works as well. So yeah, Piazza is good. Let's see. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, am I, am I live? Uh-oh. Hello? Hello? Can I still be heard? Okay, it's just the webcam frozen for some reason. Let me just... That's quite the face to have stuck on, jeez. Oh my gosh. Try again, folks. Try again. There. There. Man, I'll, good, good God, what, what a face to have stuck on. Holy smokes, all right. Um, I'd say, so for, uh, for coding bat, warm up one, two, and logic one, you can do stringer and list, um, if you want as well, but, hello? Now, now the night, did the mic change too? Yeah, geez, okay. There we go. All right. I have no idea what happened there, but uh, I think it's fixed now. Yeah, it switched off. It switched me from this microphone to that microphone for some reason. There's one built into the there's one built into the webcam. Okay. Anyway, yes. 5 minutes left in class. Let's get through 20 slides. Um so on the subject of characters. Uh, what? So, some characters are legal. Um, so, so I'd like to talk for just a moment about the differences between different types of character sets in your computer. So, way back, way back, in the early days of computing, uh, characters were represented by only seven bits. Um, 
you're like, that's not even a base two number, like eight bits, which is the word size of a computer. That seems strange. And it's like, yes, in the old days, um, thing memory was so expensive that they would shave a single bit off of a character. So this, um, the original set of uh, characters, roughly speaking, that were used in a in in computing, were called ASCII ASCII characters. This is a table of them. Boop. So, all kinds of interesting ones. You've got things like the null character. You've got things like carriage return. You've got things like the alarm character. Like, some of these characters are thing like mechanical actions on typewriters, like carriage return. Things that would have existed on things like the Electra uh, typewriters, if that's what, uh, I think that's what they were called. Um, and then, you know, once you get into higher numbers, you end up with, like, the actual alphabetic and numeric characters that we all know and love. Uh, but the characters that you had available to you were restricted to this subset, and that was restricted largely by the number of bits that were available uh, to the representation back in the 70s. Now, you may notice that there are only Roman characters uh, on this list. There are no accented characters. There are no um, Cyrillic characters or characters from um, Mandarin or simplified Chinese or... Um, I forget what the Japanese call their characters. I think it's... I forget. My brain is very fuzzy today. But anyway, you know, as computers eventually permeated the entire world, it became more and more necessary for, um, for characters to, um, to have more and more... You, you needed more and more characters available. ASCII gang, yeah. Um, kanji, yes, thank you. So, essentially, they added more bits. Every bit that you added allowed you to double the number of characters that your, that your uh, character data type could represent, right? So, um, we now work with, uh, primarily with a... Um, a character set called UTF-16, uh, which is, uh, I believe that stands for um, Universal Type Font or something like that. Um, yeah, ASCII code. Yeah, I'm basically recapitulating this slide. So um, it's an international specification. Um, normally only really basic font... Oops. Normally, only your really basic fonts will have characters defined for all of the, um, all of these. Like if you want to, if you want to do it in like, uh, you know, some weird font like Gothic or something, you know, Gothic new, uh, it probably doesn't have, you know, it probably doesn't have Arabic characters or something, but Arial probably has every single character defined despite the fact that there's 136,000 of them. And uh, emoji are also in this category. Emoji are Unicode characters. So, the net result of that... Uh, and so, essentially, uh, in Python, you have Unicode characters available to you. So, if you... Um, uh, translate.google.ca or com or whatever... Um, if we write in English, hello, please give me cold medicine. And you translated that to, um, ooh, how about Scots Gaelic? Nah, that's too Roman. Need something less Roman. There we go. Um, in theory, you should just be able... To, these uh, will be encoded in Unicode characters, so you should just be able to copy that. And S is equal to... Da, 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 paste. There we go. 
I don't think all of these codes, I don't think all of these characters are represented in, um, uh, in terminal even, but there you go. Um, in Python, you can use full Unicode characters in order to encode your strings with. Um, so yeah, any, any, any language, anything, you're good. So yeah, um, uh, yeah, anyway, um, so that's, that's class. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them now. Otherwise, I'm going to go um, fall over somewhere, probably onto a couch, at least for a few minutes. Um, but yeah, like and subscribe, folks. Like and subscribe. <laughs> yes. I'm notoriously bad at um, pronouncing stuff from the Indian subcontinent, so I'm not even going to try unless I have to. Sorry. At least not in my present, not in my present um, level. I, I feel like I, I've taken a, uh, um, I feel like I have disadvantage on all of my checks, uh, all of my skill checks right now. As well as intelligence and wisdom saving throws. I don't understand 3C from assignment 2. Could I help? Um, have you tried asking the question on Piazza? If you don't get satisfaction from Piazza, then send me an email about it. Okay? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I think I need chemical inspiration in the form of coffee. Uh, although I already had coffee. Um, okay, cool. Uh, See you guys tomorrow. And um, if I'm just a, uh, if I'm a quivering mass of mucus by tomorrow, then um, we'll try to do the lecture anyway. Take her easy, folks. <laughs>